Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm going to read a story by Anthony Doerr from his first book, a collection of short stories, The Shell Collector, published in 2002. The title is For a Long Time, This Was Griselda's Story. Anthony Doerr was born in Ohio in 1973, took his college degree from Bowdoin College, and went on to earn an MFA from Bowling Green State University. Over the years, he has lived and worked in several countries in Africa and in New Zealand, and now resides in Boise, Idaho with his wife and two children. Dorr was a Guggenheim Fellow in 2010 and has received a number of other rewards and prizes. He's best known to our audience here at the Forest at Duke for his second novel, All the Light We Cannot See, published in 2014, which won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction in 2015. All the Light We Cannot See is set in France during World War II and centers on a blind young French girl and a young German boy whose paths eventually intersect. If you're lucky to have read it, it's wonderful. He sets his, his pieces in places where he is living or has lived. And this one is set where he's currently living, Boise, Idaho. So you'll get a little bit of that flavor of the mountain northwest. For a long time, this was Griselda's story. In 1979, Griselda Drown was a senior footballer at Boise High. A terrifically tall girl with trunky thighs, slender arms, and a volleyball serve that won an Idaho State Championship, despite t-shirts claiming it was a team effort. She was a gray-eyed growth spurt, orange-haired, and an early bloomer. Griselda's father was long gone. Her mother worked two shifts at Boise Linen Supply. Her younger sister, Rosemary, too short and plump to play, was equipment manager for the team. She sat on a fold-up chair and flipped scoreboard switches, penciled sta status statistics, occasionally pumped air into flat volleyballs while the coach made the team run wind sprints. It began on an August afternoon after practice, with Griselda on the sidewalk in the shadow of the bricked gymnasium. A social studies book slipped under one long arm, listening to the air bricks of school buses and the wind rasping in a thin school front stand of aspens. Her sister, curly-headed, eyes just clearing the dash, pulled up in the rust-pucked Toyota the girls shared with their mother. They headed for the Idaho fairgrounds, the Great Western Fair, Griselda in the front seat with her big knees wedged against the glove box, leaning her long face out the window to catch the wind. Rosemary drove slowly, stopped completely at stop signs, was clumsy with the clutch. At the fairgrounds, we saw them in the parking lot inhaling the effluvium of carnival, the smells of fried dough, caramel, and cinnamon the flap-flapping of tents, a carousel plinking out music box songs, voluptuous sounds bouncing down tent ropes and along the trampled dust of the midway, wind-curled handbills, staple gun to telephone poles, the hum of gas-powered generators and the gyro truck, the lemonade truck, pretzels and popcorn, baked potatoes, the American flag, the rumblings of rides and the disconnected screams of riders. All of it shimmered before them like a mirage, something not quite real. Griselda strode to the rope gate entrance, the ticket seller's cage, and Rosemary plodded behind the foothills of Boise lifting beyond the tent peaks, brown and hazed into a pale sky. Griselda took a pair of wrinkled singles from her pocket and passed them through. This is how we told Griselda's story later, in checkout lanes or in the bleachers during volleyball games, two sisters strolling the midway single file, Griselda in the lead and Rosemary behind. They bought cotton candy for a quarter, moved about with faces half wrapped in a pink cumulus of sugar, plodding through the catcalls of game operators. Squirt the gun in the clown's mouth. Break the balloon now, girls. They paid quarters to sling rings over Coke bottlenecks. Rosemary pulled a rubber ducky from a water trough with a fishing pole and won a small and smudgy panda 
with plastic button eyes and a scowl made of thread. The sunlight went long and orange. The sisters drifted among the booths and rides, feeling vaguely sick, cotton candy dissolving in their mouths. Finally, in the purpling dust, they arrived at the metal eater's tent at the far corner of the fairgrounds. A crowd had gathered, men mostly, in jeans and boots. Griselda stopped, hipped herself a place between them, easily saw over the capped and hatted heads. There was a card table at the back of the tent, set up from the ground on risers, spotlit yellow. She smelled the rubber tent smell, saw the lazy lift of insects in the spotlight, heard the men around her discuss the impossibility and strangeness of metal eating. Rosemary couldn't see. She shifted from foot to foot. She mentioned that they should go. It was getting late. The crowd filled in behind them. She studied her sister, the panda hanging from her fist. I could lift you, she, uttered, she offered. Rosemary blushed, shook her head. It's a metal eater, Griselda whispered. I've never seen one. I don't even know what one is. It'll be fake, Rosemary said. It won't be real. This kind of stuff is never real. Griselda shrugged. The sisters looked at each other. I want to see it, Griselda insisted. I can't see it, Rosemary whined. Now it was Griselda's turn to shake her head. Then don't, she said. Rosemary's face went stern and hurt. She clumped off toward the car, the panda against her chest like a rueful child. Griselda watched the stage. Soon the metal leader came out, and the men in the tent quieted, and there was only the whimpering of the crowd and the slow looping of insects in the yellow spotlight, and far off the plink plinking of the carousel. The metal eater was a tidy looking man in a business suit, trim and small and mannered. Griselda stood transfixed. What a man he was! What glitty spectacles! What shiny shoes! What a neatness to his construction! What pinstripes and cufflinks! to wear to eat metal in Boise, Idaho. She had never seen a man like him. He seated himself at the raised up table, moving with a delicacy and tidiness that made Griselda want to charge the stage, throw herself upon him and smother him, consume him, flail her body against his. He was madly different, significant, endlessly captivating. She must have discerned something deep beneath his surface, something less acutely evident to the rest of us. He produced a razor blade from the vest pocket and slit a sheet of paper lengthwise with it. Then he swallowed it. He kept his eyes on hers without blinking. His Adam's apple jerked furiously. He swallowed a half dozen razors, then bowed and disappeared behind the tent. The cloud clapped politely, almost confusedly. Griselda's blood boiled over. When Rosemary returned to that place after dusk, indignant and frizz-haired, the metal-eating show was long done, and Griselda was long gone, leaning over a plate of sausage patties in the Galaxy Diner on Capitol. Her eyes were still on the gray eyes of the metal-eater, and his were still on hers. By midnight, she was gone from Boise altogether. Lying across the bench sheet, seat of a rider truck, the metal eater crossing into Oregon and Griselda's head in his lap, his thin fingers in her hair. In the morning, Mrs. Drown made Rosemary tell her story to a traffic cop, who yawned, thumbs through his belt loops. But you aren't even writing it down, Mrs. Drown stammered. Griselda was 18, he told her. What should he be writing down? By law, she was a woman. He pronounced woman loudly and carefully. Woman, he said to have hope. He'd heard the same story a thousand times. She'd come home eventually. They always did. Around school, the stories around about Griselda took on teeth and venom. Even left the school and lived for a while in produce sections and movie queues. She'll be back soon, we told each other, and boy, will she be sorry. Dashing off with a carnival freak twice her age, 
a bad seed anyway, you wouldn't believe the things she'd do. Mrs. Drown went sour immediately. We'd see her in Shaver's supermarket after work, shrunken, embittered, a basket of celery hung on an arthritic forearm, a handkerchief knotted around her neck. She imagined herself moving at the center of a pocket of formalities. Why, Mrs. Drown, this rain is something, isn't it? While her daughter's story spun all around her, circulating in the town's whispers, just outside her hearing. Within a month, she refused to leave home. She got fired. Her friends stopped coming by. They talked too much anyhow, is what she told Rosemary, who had dropped out of school to take her job at Boise Lennon. Who talks too much? Mom, everybody, everybody talks behind your back. You turn your back and off they go, talking at you, telling each other stories they don't know the first thing about. Of course, it wasn't long before we stopped talking about Griselda. She didn't come back. There was nothing new or interesting about a portly sister who worked 14 hours a day or a mother made bitter by a long lost daughter. There were new bodies in the high school, new fodder for rumors. Griselda's story was scrapped for lack of new material. Unfortunately for her, Mrs. Drown never stopped believing that the gossip lived just one breath beyond earshot. She shouted at us when we strolled past the bungalow on our way into the hills. Stop blabbing, she'd yell from a window. Rumor mongers. She moved into Griselda's room, slept in Griselda's bed. Her skin went sallow, yellow. She didn't go out even for the mail. Dust mounted up. The yard went brown. The gutters clogged with mulch. The house looked as if it were about to sink into the earth. All this time, Griselda sent letters home. Rosemary found them in the mail, one every month, lying between bills, envelopes addressed with tiny printing beneath a wild series of stamps and postmarks. The letters were short, misspelled things. Dear Mom and Sis, this city we're in has an acre reserved for dead people. They are kept in tall stacks of things like white cupboards with drawers inside. There are grass aisles to walk between. It's lovely. Our show is going well. The riots are on the other side of the island. Like you, we hardly know they're there. They never explained, never betrayed a guilty twitch or regretful pause. Rosemary sat on her bed, mouthing the names on the stamps and postmarks. Malachi. Bella Horizonte, Kinabalu, Damascus, Samara, Florence. They were names from anywhere and everywhere. Each envelope stamped with some euphony like Sicilian, Mazatlan, Nairobi, Fiji, or Malta. Names that invoked for her imagination in the great unknown tracts of land and ocean that lay beyond Boise. She would sit on her bed holding a letter for hours imagining the hands that had moved it along its path between her sister and Boise, between herself and the cloud pink alpine glow of Nepal, the millennial gardens of Kyoto, the black tide of the Caspian Sea. There was a world glimmering beyond Boise Linen, Shaver's supermarket, outside the cracked and sinking bungalow in the North End. It was another world altogether, and her sister was out in it. Rosemary never showed the letters to her mother. She decided it was best for her mother if Griselda was gone permanently, gone for good. Life for most Rosemary yawned around the letters, her mother, and work. Dull, heavy-footed, tasteless. At Boise Linen, she supervised dyed cloth as it rolled onto bobbins, back stinging day long, sitting behind safety goggles and listening to the grind and groan of spooling machines. She gained weight. Her feet wore down the soles of shoes. She took meticulous grocery lists to shavers, balanced her checkbook with a nubbed pencil, fed soup to her crumbling mother. She did not bother to clean the house or buy makeup. The curtains went gray. Twinkie wrappers spouted from couch cushions. Ants moved roved in the metal mouths of soda cans, stuck to window sills. Eventually, she gave her ring finger to Duck Winters, 
the timid and overweight butcher at Shavers who smelled permanently of ground beef. He moved into the sinking bungalow. He helped in a sheepish kind of way, tinkering around the yard, beer can in one hand, flushing out the lopsided gutters, replacing the screen door and the cracked sections of the front walk. He tolerated Mrs. Drown, her inane mutterings about gossip mongers, and her insistence on sleeping in Griselda's room by keeping himself half drunk on watery beer. He was sincere and big and fell asleep while Rosemary did the find a word beside him. Occasionally they grappled together at awkward sex, but it never took. And still the letters from Griselda came each month, missives from all over the world, tucked inside envelopes stamped with heart-pulling names, Kathmandu, Auckland, Reykjavik. Ten years after Griselda ran off with the metal eater, Duck Winters found his mother-in-law dead in the bathroom. Natural causes. When he came home from Shavers that evening, Duck drudged into the bedroom and found Rosemary splayed on the bed. Her thick legs stuck out straight, tears shining on her cheeks. A tidily tied bundle of envelopes on her knee, a ragged stuffed panda in her lap. Duck lay at him, looked at him, excuse me, Duck lay down beside her and put a hand on her neck. Rosemary looked at him from tear-rimmed eyes. You should know, she blubbered. My sister's been sending letters all this time. I didn't want Mom to find out. I know, whispered Duck. She's been everywhere, all over the world, all these places with the same man. Duck pulled her to him, held her head against his belly and rocked her. She told Duck Griselda's story while he shushed her and kissed the teardrops sliding over her cheeks. I know, he whispered, everybody knows. Rosemary sobbed, buried herself into him. They held on, Duck kissing the top of her head, the smell of her hair in his nose. After Rosemary lay in Duck's big arms and kissed and whispered, those are my sister's stories. Those are for her. We have our own stories, right, Duck? He said nothing. He might have been asleep. In the morning, Duck woke late, and when he came into the kitchen, Rosemary was burning the last envelope from her carefully preserved bundle. Together, they watched it turn black and then flake apart in the sink. Duck took her by the wrist and walked her out under a gleaming sky. The trees and grass greened from rain the day before. They climbed past the neighborhood into a nameless gulch, huffing and wheezing through the sagebrush in their weight-tortured Reeboks, wading through prairie star, peppergrass, sunflower, the gossamery spores of plants kicked free and floating. They stopped on a high ridge, panting, paint, panting. The town stretched out below them, the Capitol Dome, the arbor-lined streets, the slim neighborhoods of the North End in rows and far off, the glittering Oihi Mountains. Duck took off his flannel shirt and laid it down over the wildflowers, and they made love among the, me the moaning crickets, the drifting schools of spores, under the sky in the foothills above the town of Boise. From then on, they lived with a measure of contentment, learning each other finally imperceptibly. Duck whitewashed the bungalow. Rosemary planted a backyard stone for her mother. They shined up the doors and windows, carried out boxes and bags of old clothes, volleyball trophies, high school notebooks. They tried diets. We'd even see them out walking, hand-holding in a lazy lap around Camel's Back Park. Griselda's monthly letters went into the kitchen trash without so much as a glance at the postmark. Then one day, years later, the ad appeared. It was in the funny section of the Sunday Idaho Statesman, an ad for the Metal Eaters World Tour, a kind of cultish extravaganza. Selling out all over the globe, coming to the gym at Boise High in January. It was extravagant, a full newspaper page, featuring ludicrous fonts dripping into one another, a barely dressed cartoon girl proclaiming outrageous things, that the metal eater never continued the same, consumed the same thing twice, 
that he had eaten a Ford Ranger just two weeks before at his tour stop in Philadelphia. Roseberry, Duck said over brand cereal and donuts, you're not going to believe this. Everybody wanted tickets. We wouldn't miss it. It sold out in four hours. The telephones blitzed over at the high school, people clamoring for a bigger venue. But Rosemary wouldn't go. She wouldn't hear of it, wouldn't dream of it. $25 a person, she moaned. You've got to be kidding me. Can't we move on, Duck? Can't we forget? A letter from Griselda arrived a week later, a Tampa postmark. Rosemary shredded it and dropped the pieces into the trash. On the afternoon before the metal eater was to appear in the gym, the management at Shavers declared that the supermarket would close its doors on the last day of the month. It had been losing money for years, I said. Everyone shopped at the Albertsons on state. They would be letting people go immediately. Duck slocked out to the loading dock in his bloodied apron and sat on a milk crate. It was snowing. Clumps of flakes were melting in the alley. The produce manager tapped Duck on the back and held up a case of beer. They drank and talked a little about where they could find work. The produce manager got a call from his wife. She couldn't go to the metal eating show with him tonight. He offered the ticket to Duck. My wife, mumbled Dick. Duck, she wouldn't let me go. She says it's a waste of money. Duck, groaned the produce manager, we just lost our jobs. You think we don't deserve a night to ourselves? Duck shrugged back. Look, the produce manager said, tonight this guy is going to eat metal. I heard he might eat a snowmobile. Besides, he went on, Griselda Drown might be there. Somewhat had built a stage in the high school gym, blocked it off with a maroon curtain and surrounded it with fold-up chairs. $25 ahead and the place was packed. A half hour later, the curtain groaned upwards and there was the metal eater, seating behind a table. He was little, a well-kept 50-something in a black suit, white shirt, black necktie. He sat at the table, prim, a halo of gray hair beneath a pink shiny head like a half egg. His eyes were gray, drawn back, and too big. Behind him, a sequined blue curtain shifted briefly, then hung still. We waited, shuffled our snow boots at this plain spectacle. This unimpressive man seated before a bare table in the plain glow of gymnasium lights. We whispered, shifted, sweated. Upon us sat the steam of congregated people in parkas. The snow fell outside onto many vans and wagons in the school lot, and the air had taken on the smell of slush and impatience. A baby began to howl. The rubber-capped legs of the fold-up chairs creaked on the hardwood. Snow boots squeaked on the three-point line. We studied our handbills claiming impossible and remarkable things. See the metal eater who eats scrap tin, an entire outboard motor, never the same act twice. It was difficult to believe that the little man at the table was going to do anything. Doug came in with the produce manager, and they found seats near the back. Then the, cub the sequin back curtain floated aside, and out came a woman who could only have been Griselda Drown. She was all thighs and calves, in a shiny slit-legged dress, heels ridiculously high, tapering down to minuscule points. How did she walk on those shoes? How could she even stand in them? Those long calves scissoring at her dress, sparkling madly. A few men whistled. She moved like a giraffe, tall but appropriately graceful, unimpeded by her body. Her hair was yarded back and rose like someone had clamped it in a vice. Eyes like whirlpools, long-fingered hands wheeling a cart over the uneven boards of the stage toward the table where the little man sat. She dwarfed the metal eater, her breasts contained in that glittering dress, the line between them soft and dark. She took a white napkin from her cart, held it above the metal eater's bald head, snapped it, lowered it, and nodded it behind his neck. 
In turn, she took a butter knife, a fork, and a tin plate from her cart, dinging the knife and fork to prove they were made of metal, and then dinging them against the plate. That's metal, too. She laid them down, setting the table, fork, knife, and plate. The metal eater sat implacable in front of his table setting. Griselda turned a flourish of sparkle and rolled her cart back the way she came. Her thighs flashed under the slit gown, long and thick and suntanned. She disappeared behind the sequin black curtain. The metal eater sat alone at the table under the raw light of humming gym bulbs. What would he eat? Was Griselda going to wheel out some awful metal repast? A chainsaw or an office chair? The papers claimed that the metal eater had eaten a lawnmower, swallowed down the wing of a Cessna. The produce manager announced he would ask for his money back if they didn't bring back Duck's sister-in-law in the next 10 minutes. The metal eater ate, sat smugly, napkin around his neck. He took the knife and fork in his little pink fists. He held them against the table, upright, ends down, like a petulant child awaiting supper. Then with a certainty and casualness that was almost appalling, he took the knife, slid it down his throat, and closed his mouth behind it. He sat, natty, unruffled, staring at the crowd, some of whom missed the feet entirely and were only now swinging their heads around as brothers or uncles tugged their sleeves. The metal eater had a fraction of a smile on his lips. His Adam's apple was the only part of him that moved. It jerked freakishly up and down and side to side like a muscled and angry monkey chained by one ankle. He followed the knife with the fork, nudging it down. While he swallowed the fork, he folded the plate into quarters, his throat straining wildly, his shoulders perfectly still, and put that into his mouth and poked it down with one finger. His Adam's apple jerked, seized, and thrashed. After a half minute or so, it slowed, then restored itself to its original sedated state. The little metal eater unknotted the napkin, dabbed at the corners of his mouth, stood up from the table, and bowed. He tossed the napkin into the first rows of the crowd. Applause started slowly. Just the produce manager and some others in the back, bringing their hands together, and then others joined in. And it mounted, and soon we were beside ourselves, hooting and hollering and pounding the floor with our boot heels. How about that, the produce manager was shouting. Finally, one blue spotlight switched on. A single shaft of light falling from the ceiling to illuminate the center of the stage where a tall figure had appeared in a suit of plated armor, complete with visored helmet, an ostrich plume canting off the peak. Another spotlight came on yellow and shone on the metal eater, stationed like a tiny well-dressed peasant beside the armored figure. He held a stool, which he set down and squatted on, facing the crowd. He withdrew a ball-peen hammer from his suit pocket and twirled it in his palm. Then he removed the shin legging from one foot of the armored figure and folded it and banged it flat against the floor of the stage. He folded it again and banged it flat again. Then he pushed it down his throat, swallowing contentedly on his stool his Adam's apple flailing madly. Beneath the removed armor, in the ray of blue, we could see one long calf and a bare foot. It took the metal eater less than a minute to swallow down the legging. He promptly moved to the other. How about that, whispered the produce manager. Is that for real? The crowd began to get into it, clapping as the metal eater removed each piece of armor, the thigh pieces next, and when it was clear that the thick suntan legs belonged to Griselda, we stood and pounded the floor and cheered, and everyone was grinning and enjoying the show. The metal eater swallowed on, his frenetic Adam's apple riveting each swallow home. Within 20 minutes, the metal eater had done most of the work. All that remained to eat were the helmet and massive chest piece. Griselda held her arms out from her body, palms to the sky. We stomped the floor to match the rhythm of the metal eater's swallowing. 
When he had choked down the last gauntlet, the metal eater slid his stool behind Griselda and climbed onto it. The boots pounded the floor. The metal eater brought his arms above both his head and hers and gently tugged the ostrich plume free, letting it float to the stage in front of them. Then with a flourish of wrists and fingers, he removed her helmet. Her hair, orange and long, slipped free. And we were rapturous, screaming and cheering and whistling. The metal eater climbed off his stool, took the helmet and flattened it under one dazzling wingtip. He folded it and banged it flat again. Then he lit into it with his teeth. It took him only two minutes to eat it, and we were at frenzy pitch by the time he finished. The produce manager was hugging Duck, and tears were on his cheeks. If that isn't something, he shouted, if that isn't something. The metal eater climbed back on the stool, stretched as widely as he could, and ran his fingers along both of Griselda's arms, over her biceps, and onto her shoulders and under the chest piece. He dislodged it, held it in front of her for an unbearably long moment, and finally raised it high over their heads into the trembling blue spotlight. And we beheld Griselda, her broad and flat belly, her navel, her breasts, and her outstretched arms, a masterpiece of a woman, a marble column fixed in a blade of light, a golden blue monument, Amid salvos of ovations, the metal eater folded and flattened the final piece until he could fit his mouth around it and gulped it down. In the aftermath, the pandemonium subsided. Bows were demanded and demanded again, the gymnasium lights burning once more at full lacerating power, the men in utility belts already dismantling the stage. Duck sat shaken and sweat damped. He gathered himself into his big puppy coat, stood and tottered into the headlight swept parking lot, shuffling through the new snow over the slushy curbs. Rumbling at the back of the parking lot was an 18 wheeler, its wipers sliding slowly over the windshield, running lights glowing yellow across the top of the cab and down the lines of the trailer. From bumper to bumper, the truck was painted an extravagant green. The Metal Eater's logo laid lustily across it, and before Duck knew what he was doing, he walked past his car to the end of the lot and rapped on the window of the cab. Griselda herself answered, leaning through the open door, one foot on the running board, stooped so she could push her head out, orange hair framing her face. She looked like a very tall Rosemary squinting at him like Rosemary did when she was trying to figure something out. I'm Duck Winters, Duck said. I know all about you. He stammered, he smiled. He asked if she would like to come over the house for tea or beer or whatever. I think you should see your sister, he said. It might be good. I lost my job today. He tried for a smile that was more like a shrug. Griselda smiled back. Okay, she said, once the truck gets loaded. So that's how it came to be that Duck Winters drove through the snowy and quiet residential streets of Boise's North End, steering slowly and cautiously home after midnight with a lurid 18-wheeler inches from his rear bumper. Rosemary woke to air brakes sighing in the street. She heard boots on the front walk, low voices, and the refrigerated duck door unstick as it opened. She pushed herself up in bed. Duck appeared, prancing down the hall, tracking snow along the rug. His hair was slicked down with sweat. His cheeks flushed. He put his mittened hands on her shoulders. Rosie, he hissed, you awake? You're not going to believe it. He was bursting over. You're just not going to believe it. He took her by the wrists, pulled her out of bed, her hair frizzed, wearing only a tight t-shirt and green sweatpants. He hauled her down the hall through the melting tract in snow to stand in the kitchen doorway and behold her sister, seated at the kitchen table, towering and radiant and glittering in a red kimono, holding hands with a little man in a black tweed suit with an awkward look on his face. 
On the table in front of each of them stood an open can of beer. Rosemary found it impossible to look at Griselda. Her presence was too solar for this kitchen with its cracked countertops and veneered cabinets. A box of stale donuts, a wilted amaryllis slumped out of its plastic pot, a porcelain Santa on the windowsill that should have been put away weeks ago. Moonlight fell in parallelograms through the kitchen window. In the basin of the sink sat a bowl of half full of sludgy cereal. Duck squeezed past her and said, this is your sister, he gushed, and her husband, Jean. You should not have seen them tonight, Rosie, the show they put on. It was incredible. You'd never believe it. You guys should talk. Rosie, you and your sister is what I was thinking. It's her first time home in 20 years. She said she wrote a letter. It was nice of them to come, wasn't it? Their truck's outside. They actually live in their truck. We have tea if you guys don't like that beer. Out the kitchen window, Rosemary saw maybe two dozen neighbors laboring across the lawn, figures examining the cab of the metal eater's truck, faces peering in the living room window. Griselda asked Rosemary if she'd been getting the letters, and Rosemary managed to nod her head. Griselda said something about the new light fixture above the sink, about how it was nice. Rosemary watched a slushy boot print turning to water on the kitchen floor. Duck was toddling around the kitchen, rummaging through the fridge. He offered the guests summer sausage, noodle salad, pushed a can of beer into Rosemary's hand, and announced that the metal eater had an entire suit of armor inside his stomach right here. Rosie in our very own kitchen. Isn't that something? Rosemary stood rigid and barefoot in the doorway. Her sister, the men, the peeping neighbors, and the eight-wheeler outside, all this loomed in the outskirts of her vision. She blinked her eyes several times. The beer can in her hand was cold. The boot print of snow on the kitchen tile was turning to water. She moved through the kitchen, set the beer on the table, and tore a paper towel from the rack under the sink. She swabbed at the boot print on the floor, watched the paper absorb the gray slush. Duck and me, she said, we've been married 15 years. You know that, Griselda? Her voice didn't shake, and she was glad for it. She stood and leaned on the table, the damp and crumpled paper towel in her fist. You know, Mom would go to sleep with one of your volleyball trophies in her arms. You know that after she died, we poured out her ashes in the backyard. At work, I dyed giant sheets of linen and guide them into spools all day. That's what Mom used to do while we were at school every day. She took Duck's hand and held it. I used to want to leave, she said. I used to want to get out of Boise so bad. But this, she gestured at the kitchen, the bowl of abandoned cereal, the amaryllis, and the porcelain Santa. This is a life, at least. This is a place to come home to. Griselda had begun to cry, quiet sobs like whispers. Rosemary stopped. A moment like this, the four of them around the table under the sad, dusty kitchen lamp could never accommodate all the things she had to say. She went to the metal eater and took him by the wrist and led him out the door into the snow. Hey, she yelled at the metal eater, at the 18-wheeler, at the foothills standing up white under the moon, at all of us standing there on her lawn. Here he is. I want you all to get a good look. Look at him. She was screaming. You think eating metal is any harder than what I do, than what each of you do? You think this man is amazing. Look at him. But, and this is what we remembered later, she was the one we looked at, her hair trembling on her head like flames, her shoulders back, her chest quaking. An image of power and fury. She burned magnificent in the snow, barefoot in a t-shirt and green sweatpants, shouting at us. Griselda appeared and took the metal eater by the arm and led him out to their truck. Duck brought Rosemary inside and shut the door, and the lights in the house went off, and the curtains snapped shut. 
We watched the big truck labor into gear and rumble past the drive, and each of us filed through the snow back to our homes, and the sounds of the night finally faded until there was nothing to hear but snow coming down from the hills and pressing against the windows of our houses. A shouting in the streets. The heart wavers, surges to life, wavers again. Griselda's letters still came once a month, and Rosemary and Duck went on living their lives. Duck found work as a grill cook at a steakhouse. Rosemary inherited a beagle from a deceased co-worker. This was when Boise was growing like mad, and there were always new people around, people building mansions in the hills, people who didn't know there had ever been a Shaver's supermarket. Sometimes in the spring, we'd stroll past the bungalow and see Rosemary on the front step doing the find-a-word in the Statesman, Duck dozing in the chair beside her, the beagle watching us from between their feet. Rosemary would be chewing the end of her pencil, thinking hard, and we'd begin to tell whoever was with us the story, and we'd hike up into the hills, up the Steve Pass to a place where we could see the mountains be beyond the hills, jagged and endless, illuminated under the sun, folding back on each other all the way to the horizon.